In Egyptian tomb paintings, their owners and their families usually appear healthy and in the prime of life. But their servants and ordinary workmen appear with a wide variety of ailments reflecting the harsh realities of life. For the past three years, Margaret Judd of the Sudan Archaeological Research Society has been exploring a cemetery in northern Sudan to find out how the dead really lived. So far, she's excavated several burials located near one of Egypt's trade routes to Central Africa. Their bones and teeth confirm that the life of a trader was not always easy. This individual here is a young male, approximately 25 years of age. And you can see that the teeth are abraded, which is due to cultural practice that can be caused by the diet or an alternative use of the teeth as a tool. There are very few cavities in these individuals, although this one does have a slight abscess right in the lower left mandible. Part of the problem was sand. In the desert, sand got into everything, including the most common staple, bread. A steady diet of sand could wear away even the strongest teeth in no time. But his teeth were not his only problem. The individual also has a couple fractures. Uh, the right forearm is fractured. There's a, a mid-shaft fracture to the ulna and radius, which is often due to fending off a blow. The ulna did not heal properly. The radius, however, is perfectly healed. The lower leg also has a healed fracture. It's the left fibula and tibia, and the fracture has fused upon healing. And because the, the fibula isn't necessary for transportation, the individual probably did not have any problem walking at all. One of the most extensive collections of ancient Egyptian human remains is kept at the medical school of Cairo University. Roxy, here are your bones. Roxy Walker of the Bioanthropology Foundation has been examining the skeletons of two females, one a commoner and one a queen. Yes. Just by looking at their bones, she can tell who's who. 4,000 years ago, this young woman lived and walked on the banks of the Nile. She led a hard life, dying at the relatively tender age of about 20. And we can see this by looking at such indicators as the extreme wear on her teeth. We see from her vertebrae that she had early arthritic changes. This is consistent with both carrying heavy burdens and with leaning over and painfully grinding grain. If we look at the bones of her upper arm, we see that the circumference is pretty robust, and there are several ridges where her upper arm muscles were actually attached. With this young woman, who died perhaps 18 months to two years younger, and you see, comparing the two left humeri, how this one is much more gracile or graceful. Indeed, her hand is slender, refined, with beautifully manicured nails stained red with henna. The identity of the first woman is unknown, but the name of the second is Queen Ashait. Her hair was beautifully prepared. Scenes show the hair of such queens being carefully dressed by a servant. Hair was a major preoccupation of the elite. A common affliction in ancient Egypt was head lice. Contrary to popular belief, lice are not the product of poor hygiene. They only live on shafts of clean, healthy hair attached to the scalp. The frequency of lice suggests the Egyptians washed their hair routinely. To prevent an infestation, some relied on regular combing and the use of oils. Others cropped their hair and wore wigs. Wigs were equally popular with men and women who valued them as status symbols. With a wide range of styles to choose from, the Egyptians changed wigs like hats.
One of the most elaborate was a double wig consisting of two separate sections, waves or curls for the top of the head and braids worn over the shoulders. Joanne Fletcher of Manchester University has made a career studying ancient tresses. She's found that when it comes to hair, the Egyptians had a lock-on style. Here we have possibly the most wonderful hair remains from the, the whole of ancient Egyptian civilization. Um, we have the, the hair of a couple uh, that lived around three and a half thousand years ago. This is the hair of, of a young man who died around the age of 30 to 35. And then, uh, the, the very best piece, um, this is the hair um, of his wife, who died rather later, aged around 55 to 60 years of age. And we can see from the, the top section her natural hair, quite fine. Um, she was obviously going quite grey uh, towards the, the end of her life. And the, the hairdressers, um, as a post-mortem addition, had actually woven in um, false hair, um, human hair extensions, which were braided in very, very carefully. The style itself represents um, a very ornate, art distinctly artificial style, the, the so-called Hattar style. The lady in question worked hard to look her best in the afterlife. Her hair, a mass of false braids and curls, was copied from sculptures of Hathor, the goddess of beauty. The curls were worn over the chest and held in place with a setting lotion made of beeswax. The attention paid to hair was as crucial in death as it was in life. An Egyptian's final appearance on earth was the prelude to eternity. Though looks were no guarantee of immortality, some would achieve it in a most unusual way. Today, one of the British Museum's prized possessions, the 2,000-year-old mummy of Artemidorus, is coming back to life. Now that his post-mortem is complete, the museum is anxious to see if the face on his coffin is an idealized portrait or a true representation of the young Egyptian.